Hi, welcome to our daily encounter. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the importance of differentiating between what is clean and what is unclean. Now, this is what the Lord is teaching the Israelites in uh, these chapters that we're that we're reading uh, today, and, and they also continue into our reading tomorrow. Uh, God gave some laws concerning uh, foods that they were to eat and foods that they were not supposed to eat. Uh, he gives commandments about um, a mother when she gives birth to children, uh, how long she is to remain unclean, and, and what she is to do about that. Um, and then in chapter 13, how to test for leprosy. Because if a person had leprosy, they definitely were considered unclean. And so we see this theme throughout our, the chapters that we're reading today in our daily reading. And each of these have uh, a practical application uh, and then also a spiritual application as well. And let's just take the, the foods for example. Uh, this very much had a practical application. Uh, these, a lot of these animals that God forbid them to partake of, uh, some would carry diseases or could uh, cause physical harm to them had they ate them. And so it was good that God, uh, you know, told him, hey, stay away from these types of meat. They're, it's not good for you. But this also had a spiritual application as well. When we go into Acts, in Acts chapter 10, uh, we see what these animals actually represent. In, in the story, we have Peter who is, uh, you know, he's, he's tired, he's waiting for dinner to get cooked, and he has this vision about these animals these animals being uh, brought down in the sheet and they're all unclean animals and the Lord tells him Peter rise up kill and eat and Peter says no Lord nothing unclean has ever touched my lips and the Lord said what I have called clean you should not call unclean and Peter would go go on to relate in chapter 15 of Acts uh, that the Lord had shown him that the Gentiles would now be cleansed through faith and so these unclean animals represented people particularly uh, the Gentile nations. And so when we go back to Leviticus chapter 11, and we look at these various characteristics of these animals, we can see characteristics in people uh, that we should be wary of and uh, try to avoid uh, if possible. Uh, for instance, uh, they were only supposed to eat uh, the beast and the cattle of the field who uh, chewed the cud and also divided the hoof. Now, um, what this represents is uh, the type of people who are able to, one, meditate on God's word, and then secondly, divide between good and evil. If you think about a, a cow chewing the cud, uh, what are they doing? They're, they're basically re uh, bringing back up the food that they had already eaten and chewing it up again, swallowing it, bringing it back up and chewing it and swallowing it and getting all the nutrients out of the food. Well, the same thing is true with those who meditate on God's Word. They not only read God's Word, but they meditate on it. They bring it back to memory again and think about it some more. And then later on, bring it back to memory again, think about it some more. Uh, this is what we should be doing with our daily reading. Not just reading it in the morning and then putting it to the side and forgetting about it, but constantly bringing it back up to memory and thinking about it. But then also... While we're doing that, what we ought to walk away with is, is the ability to divide between good and evil. To be able to show what is right in the eyes of the Lord and that which is displeasing in the eyes of the Lord. And the more and more we meditate on God's word, the more and more we'll be able to do that. And so anyone who, who doesn't have those two things going on in their lives, something is amiss. Uh, and, and if you're relating it to... Leviticus chapter 11, that person is, in a sense, unclean, um, spiritually speaking. <laughs> we need to be people who do both. But then you had these fish. And the fish could only be eaten if they had fins and they also had scales. And when we think about water, water typically represents the world in scriptures. Um, if you remember the parable of the dragnet, Jesus talked about this big dragnet that that caught all these different types of fish and then once they brought all the fish in then they divided between uh, the good fish and the bad fish 
and the and the dragnet um, or the water that the dragnet was brought into was was the world and, and the, the picture was at the end time when the angels come and gather up all the people of the nations and so that that sea represents the world and so when we think about fish we think about uh, the fact that they swim in the waters and we can think about people as they navigate through this world uh, the fins would represent those who are who can navigate through the world properly they have the fins for the movement through the world <coughs> um, but then they also have the fins that protect them from the contaminants of the world and so the type of people that we want to be around is those who can navigate through the world without allowing the world to become uh, to come in and contaminate them <clears throat> uh, they they are they don't let the world enter into them you remember we're supposed to be in the world but not of the world there should be a separation there between us and the world and so that's what's being represented here with the fish um with the birds uh, these birds that were unclean were the type of birds that swoop in uh, to kill their prey and to take their prey and to eat their prey um, and this would represent people who swoop in to kill. These are people who uh, come down and destroy families. They come down and destroy churches. Um, they come down and destroy um, uh, relationships, whatever type of relationship. And uh, they are destructive. Uh, we are to avoid those type of people and, and, and keep them um, away as, far, as much as possible. But then you have these insects that uh, the ones that were unclean were the ones that just crawl on the ground. Uh, this would represent those people who always live an earthly life. They're always living in connection to this earth, always concerned about the things of this earth, only consider the things of this earth. But then there was also the birds that flew that they were to avoid. Um, these are the ones that uh, rise up above everybody else who who are arrogant and puffed up and uh, place themselves in a higher place than everyone else. The only ones that are clean are those that, yes, they were on the ground, but uh, they could hop and they could, they could rise up above the circumstances of this earth based upon their faith. Um, the grasshoppers could hop and, and get away from the earth, but not so much to where they would exalt themselves over the other insects. Um, uh, and so, uh, that's the type of people that we need to be and the type of people we need to be around. Those who are humble, but yet not uh, part of the earth. And then, uh, lastly, in connection to these animals, uh, I'll, we're running out of time here, is that we'll deal with is uh, the dead animals. The dead animals were also to be avoided. Those who died on their own. And, and of course, we should be... Uh, real careful about the people that we're around who are spiritually dead <clears throat> now we do need to be around those people we need to influence them uh, we need to be around them to be a good example and to share God's word with them uh, but we don't want to become equally yoked with them um, and 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 uh, let them kind of take over our lives to the point that they become an influence on us um, we just don't want to do that. So so death was something that they should have avoided and, and we should be very wary of as well. Alright, so that has to do with the animals. But then you have the laws of motherhood here. And so when a, when a woman would give birth, uh, she would be unclean for a particular period of time. If it was a son, it was for 33 days. If it was a daughter, it was 66 days. And... <clears throat> And so this was uh, to make things a little bit more sanitary, um, less li likely to spread uh, disease and infections and stuff. They had a practical use, had practical uses for them back then. Uh, but spiritually speaking, it has application for us as well. Uh, when a mother gives birth, she is giving birth to flesh. Remember in John chapter three, Jesus told Nicodemus, "That which is born of flesh is flesh." And any time that we uh, produce uh, the flesh from us, uh, it, it causes us to be unclean, especially when it comes to 
doing God's service and doing God's work. Whenever we are engaged in either sharing the gospel or teaching a message or you know ministering to others, giving an encouraging word, whatever it is that we're doing, it should never be from our the strength of our flesh. It should never be according to man's logic or or man's way of thinking. Uh, it ought to be in accordance to God and according to God's will and God's heart. Uh, in First Peter chapter four, in verse ten, it says, "As each one has received a special gift, employ it in uh, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God." Whoever speaks is to do as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Why is that? So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. When we go out in the strength of the flesh, and when we're speaking and all we're speaking is and producing is that which comes from the flesh, um... Who gets the glory? Well, the flesh would get the glory in that situation. But if we go out praying to the Lord, trusting in the Lord to help us, praying that He will give us the strength to do it, and then when He accomplishes it, give Him the credit for it, then God is glorified in that. And so what ends up being produced is not that which is of flesh, but that which is of God. And, of course, that's what we want to have produced in our lives. And then we get to uh, leprosy real quick. Uh, with leprosy, you had uh, a way of determining whether a person had leprosy, whether they were clean or unclean, based upon the depth of the imperfection on their skin. Uh, if it was just a surface in imperfection, uh, then they were not considered unclean. But if it if the priest inspected it and it was deeper than the skin, then it was leprosy and they were unclean. Uh, and there was a whole procedure that they had to go through uh, with that. How that relates to, or, well, let's go with the practical. The practical reason for this is, I think, is pretty obvious because uh, leprosy can be contracted. Uh, and so you wanted to segregate those who had leprosy from the rest of the community so that the whole community wouldn't become leprous. Now the spiritual application uh, has to do with the fact that uh, leprosy represents sin and rebellion in our hearts. Um, the picture of leprosy all the way through here, if you follow, if you follow it thinking about sin, it, you can definitely see how that would fit. Um, but there are sins, you know, all of us have uh, imperfections in our lives, right? All of us a mess up, we say the wrong things, we do the wrong things, we think the wrong things, and we have imperfections. But our imperfections that we have as Christians should just be surface imperfections. In other words, these are just uh, not the norm, they're just things that we stumble at and, and we mess up and we, and we, uh, we have these imperfections. When it becomes a real problem, and, and, and I'm not saying we should just gloss over those. We need to pray over those and confess those to the Lord and, and be cleansed of them. But where the real problem is, is when it goes deeper than that. When it becomes a heart issue. When a person is no longer messing up and sinning because they're just imperfect. But they begin to do it because their heart is there. And because they become rebellious against the Lord. And because they no longer care for the things of the Lord. And they want to do the things that do things their own way. That's when it becomes deeper than just a surface imperfection. And, and that's when they need to be dealt with. And tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll talk about the cleansing of the leper. And we'll see what the process is for that. <clears throat> but what we're going to walk away here is that if, if a person has a sin problem and it goes deeper than just the surface, uh, they need to be, it needs to be dealt with. All right, so uh, this um, this all had to do with cleansing. Uh, with what we walk away from here is just the idea that we need to be conscientious about what is clean and what is not clean in our lives.